Well, hello, good evening, welcome. It's Wednesday night and time yet again for another VT Talk. And it's quite a special one tonight because tonight VT Talk is being filmed by a Swedish film crew. That's him there. Say hi, Terry. Hello. There you go. Um, and with me in the studio is Marlene Seerstadt from SVT, isn't it? That's right, Swedish television. Swedish television, which is the equivalent to the BBC over here. It's high-flying stuff. It is, yeah. Um, we're going to go through the titles, then we're going to find out, because I'm still not sure, why we're being filmed, and then we're going to talk a little bit about Snus and e-cigs in Sweden, and then we'll bring you up to speed on what happened yesterday at the Guildhall when Sav and I went down to talk e-cigs with some really quite high-flying people. But that comes up after the titles, which are coming in now. And here we are, live in the studio, and as you will see in the big monitor, instead of being in the doghouse tonight, we have Sav. Sav, how are you doing? You all right? I'm fine, Dave. How's yourself? I'm walking about and breathing. Have you uh, have you managed to recover from the trip yesterday? After a little catnap this afternoon, yes. Uh, uh, hang on. Are you allowed a catnap? Are you not supposed to have a Sav nap? I was at Cat's house, so it was a catnap. All right, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. Um... Let's let's hurtle on with this. And to whoever it was that said that Keith's looking especially fine tonight, you're not wrong. Um, so Marlene, you're across here. You've we've been filming it all day and talking about e-cigs. Obviously, there's going to be something on Swedish TV about them. What what's happening there? Uh, the thing is, um, I found out that e-cigs are becoming more and more popular here yes. uh, and in other places in Europe. And in Sweden, few people know about it. When I ask people, very few people know about it. But I guess it's go it might be more, more and more popular there too. I don't know. So uh, now it has become hot political stuff. Yes. Uh, because of the tobacco directive in uh, in Brussels. Yes. It's just for. So that's why we're making this story to tell um, one it, one angle of the tobacco directive. I see. That's yeah. great. And will you be talking to Mrs. McIvan or any of the people who want to see e cigs be made med medicinal? Uh, we are trying to get um, McIvan. Uh, so far, no luck. But uh, <laughs> we have some Swedish MEPs too uh, yes. who are involved um, um, from the same committee. Yes. So maybe um, an interview with some with her instead. Okay. That, 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 that all sounds extremely promising and I look forward to being able to see it. For our UK viewers, is, is what you're doing available to us in the UK? Can we see it on YouTube or on, on satellite? Or? No, on, on the internet. On yes, the internet. On, the, on our streamed. Okay, yep. so we'll... Uh, SVT Play. Right, we will sort out the stream and make sure that there's a link to it there so you can see what's going on. Now, if I can kind of move away from that and, and talk a little bit about SNUS because throughout the, the whole tobacco products directive we've heard mention of SNUS so many times and it's not something that we in the UK are massively familiar with but it's extremely popular in Sweden isn't it? It is, it is. Everyone knows about it and everyone knows a few people who uses it mm -hmm. or use it themselves. Okay and what, what um, what kind of, of, of inroad has it made into the market? I mean, we know that, for instance, that in, in Sweden, the smoking prevalence rate is, is very, very low, in the order of 13%, I think, whereas the European smoking prevalence rate is around about 28% on average, and even higher in Ireland, which has the very strictest rules on smoking. Yeah. Um, so when we were talking earlier you said that, that, that Sweden does have a smoking ban much as we have here in public places and but people use snus in those places and and you you told me and I, and I was quite surprised that, that I thought it was just a tiny little wee pouch that you would put in and nobody would be able to see but that's not the case is it? It could be the case it could yes. be the case but it's also the case that you 
you have your um, um, what do you call it? Uh, what a tin? A tin, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's uh, it's not small. Uh, it's not this tiny um, sacket. Yeah, yeah. Uh, pouches, 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 yeah. But it's it's bigger. You you do it. You bake your own. Oh uh, right. And it could become like big as this maybe. Ah right. And then you put it, or even bigger. You choose yourself, and then they put it under the lift like that, and <laughs> you could really tell. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well that's that's cool. So, but again, nobody, I assume, nobody takes any notice of it. Nobody makes bad comments about it. It's accepted. It's acceptable, and it's used by a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would say that. Young people as well. Young people as well. Yeah, yeah. But mm -hmm. uh, the experience of. of the Swedes is that it's not a gateway to smoking cigarettes, isn't it? It's rather the, the other way around. Sometimes uh, people start with snooze right away yes. uh, when they're young or older. Or, and, but it's quite common that they start as uh, smokers mm -hmm. and try to quit smoke and they get the nicotine uh, from snooze instead. Mm -hmm. And they do that and they want to quit smoking. They want to quit nicotine. Mm. nicotine. But it turns out that snooze is even more addictive than cigarettes. Really? It is, yeah. So a lot of people who try to stop, they go over to snooze instead and then they go on with that. Instead of quitting. <laughs> I think I've got to get me some snooze. If it's that good, I've got to get me some. Saf, have we I've got... I've never tasted. I've never tried. Really? No. Yeah. Well, we'll have a snooze party, you and I, because I've never tried it either. We'll, we'll see how that goes. Saf, have we got anything coming in from chat? Um, there's a few questions. People are asking, is snooze the same as what we would in the UK call snuff? I think snuff is something that you snuff in your nose, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. It's, it's powdered and uh, a gentleman would take it from between his, his forefinger and his thumb. Yeah. Um, a miner would take it down the back of the hand. And, yeah. This is yeah. something that you put under your lip, yes. in your mouth. It's, it's moist snuff, yeah, it is. Uh, is how it's known. Yeah. Any, anything more, Saf? Also, um, there's a couple of people have been asking about the, is it true that Sweden has the lowest death rate due to smoking related illnesses and things? I'm sorry, but I don't know that actually. I'm, I don't know. I think um, I have seen figures on it somewhere, but I can't remember what they are. So I'm, I can't really help there either. Sav, anything more from that? No, they're all just, uh, um, I mean, there's a few people saying that, um, that yes, uh, snus is way less harmful than smoking. There's also been a couple of comments about the when it was banned that um, they went through a very similar process that we're currently going through within the European Parliament. And the word corruption has been mentioned a few times. <laughs> I see. I see. Well, that's, that's you know, um, who am I to hold my hand up and make any comment about that? But yeah, I, I've got to say I tend to agree. Um, and from what I've read, the uh, the moves to ban snus around the rest of the EU did leave a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths. Uh, I would like to see it reversed. I, I, I've no idea what your take on that is. Do you, do you think it needs to be made available all the way around Europe? Um, I have not really an opinion on that. Okay, no, no. that's that's fair enough. Um, I want. I just want to say thank you for the time you've spent with us today. Um, it, it's actually been a pleasure. Scary, but a great pleasure. Um, it's been a great pleasure for me too. And, um, oh, well, thank you very thank much. Thank you for having us. Oh, mm -hmm. I, that's n not a problem. And any time you want to come again, that's absolutely fine. Um, I do have to say, though, however, I've gone off Terry completely because when they went off to get something to eat uh, and get sorted out, there you are, ladies, have a look at Terry. And... What a handsome brute he is. You make me feel very old. Um, but don't forget to leave the camera. More than that, I'm not going to say. For the time being, thank you very much. Um, we'll move into, I think, uh, a little bit of video now from what happened yesterday down in the Guildhall in London. Now, just to try and set the scene. This was meant to be a dialogue between three sets of stakeholders, if you will. Um, the industry, the trade, the users, that's us, and public health people. And one of the comments that was made was that really there was 
only one side of the argument was there, only one side of the conversation. There were people there from public health, but they didn't really say an awful lot. Um, but it's probably as easy if I just shut my mouth and play the video in so that you can see what went on. Um, we'll start with the presentation from Lynn Dawkins, uh, who you may be aware of. Um, there's some very, very interesting stuff in, well, four out of five of the presentations, let's put it that way. The bloke that was on last was shocking. Here's Lynn Dawkins. I'm your host this afternoon, um, though obviously, as you will know, we're working with our friends from KAC on this event. Um, thank you very much for coming. We've been very pleased by the response. This is the second nicotine type event I've been involved in. Um, as the name of my organisation probably betrays, I spend most of my time obsessing about illegal drugs and alcohol and such like. So actually, it's quite exciting to be involved in something a little bit different, although I can't help but see some of the parallels between some of the <coughs> debates that uh, bedevil the drugs field around harm reduction, prevention, they shouldn't do it, and the rest of it, which obviously do, does play out here. Um, it very much reminds me uh, some of the passion and the energy that's around this debate with uh, what the drugs field was like at the end of the 90s. It gets very heated, very emotive, um, which is fine, we like a little bit of that. Um, we're in a very fortunate position, or I'm in a very fortunate position, that being funded by the City of London, albeit we have a pan London uh, role, we don't just concern ourselves about stockbrokers, alcohol and drug consumption. Um, we, we're not dependent on government money. Um, we can afford to upset people in a very friendly way. We quite enjoy an argument. And actually, if you don't already know, you're right next to a Roman amphitheatre. So if it does reach a physical <laughs> level, you can exit through the doors there <laughs> and knock it out amongst yourself and really, you know, go to town. But hopefully we won't get to that stage. Sorry, sorry, sorry to disappoint anyone on the panel. Um, on the housekeeping side, amphitheatre aside, we're not expecting any fire drills. So if the fire alarm goes, we will be leaving straight out there or potentially through there, depending on which way we get directed. Do turn your phones off. It's probably unlikely you'll get a signal down here, but if you do get a call, it'll be just at the wrong moment. We've got quite... An impressive program, we've got five speakers. Um, the format is that each of the speakers is going to be given five minutes to address three key points. I'm going to ask people in the audience to be quite restrained. There will be opportunities aplenty for you to ask for clarification, make your own points once we've gone through uh, all five presentations. Um, and then uh, the panel members will have an opportunity come back to and come back to the issues at the end. So um, without further ado, the first speaker we have is Dr. Lynn Dawkins, um, who is a psychology lecturer and head of the Addictive Behaviours Research Group at the University of East London. Prior to joining UEL in 2006, uh, she undertook her PhD and postdoc at Goldsmiths, uh, both in the area of nicotine use and smoking cessation. She is now one of the leading e-cigarette researchers in the UK, having published four papers on e-cigarette use, effects and nicotine delivery in the last two years. Lynn, please. Thank you very much. Um, I've been conducting research into nicotine and smoking for over 20 years now. And one of the things I'm constantly struck by is how difficult smokers find it to stop smoking. Whilst nearly 70% of smokers state that they want to quit, even with the use of nicotine replacement therapy, we're seeing long-term quit rates only reaching about 7% of one year. There's then also, of course, the other 30% or so who don't even want to try and stop smoking. So for them, the immediate appeal of, of the cigarette far outweighs the long-term health consequences. And I think this is absolutely staggering when we consider that one in five, one, one in two of all smokers will eventually die as a direct consequence of their smoking. So when I first heard about e-cigarettes in 2009, I was immediately fascinated by them. I started planning research studies. I considered these to be an attractive, lower-risk alternative to smoking, 
they deliver nicotine and they also offer that hand mouth activity of smoking and smokers strongly endorse that the physical sensation of, of smoking and I say lower risk I don't mean absolutely risk free but in contrast to cigarette smoking the current research evidence suggests they're much much safer so we have to remind ourselves here I think about the health consequences of tobacco smoking about 82,000 people die just in England a year as a direct consequence of, of their smoking. And I say as a consequence of their smoking, not because of their nicotine use, but as a consequence of their smoking. So the key issue for me, therefore, is to reduce smoking by whatever means possible. And the e-cigarette looks like an extremely promising means of achieving this. I think we should therefore allow e-cigarettes to compete with tobacco cigarettes as much as possible and not restrict their availability. Now, that will mean that long-term use of e-cigarettes might result in a certain percentage of the population being permanently addicted to nicotine. I'd argue that as long as this nicotine is delivered relatively safely, i.e. not in the form of tobacco smoking, this shouldn't be considered problematic, given that the harm caused by smoking is dramatically reduced. In an ideal world, of course, we would want every smoker to stop smoking completely and to stop using nicotine as well. But this really is unrealistic. We don't live in an ideal world. People are always going to engage in risky behaviours, and that includes, for some people, taking nicotine. We don't need to stop nicotine use. We do need to stop, or at least to minimise, tobacco smoking. One question that might spring to mind at this point is, well, just how effective are e-cigarettes at helping people to stop smoking? We still don't have a huge amount of data on this, in fact, but we do have a bit of an idea. So starting with a survey of e-cigarette users conducted by my team, of current e-cigarette users, 57% had said that they hadn't smoked for at least a couple of months since they started using the e-cigarette. Looking at the results of randomised controlled trials, two which have recently come out, we're seeing long-term complete cessation rates of around 7 to 13%. So equivalent to NRT, perhaps slightly exceeding NRT. But add to that the fact, the results from the recent smoking toolkit survey, that 27% of smokers who are currently undergoing a quit attempt are using e-cigarettes. So even if they're only as effective as NRT, the fact that they have unprecedented reach overall means they could have a huge effect on public health. And my final point is, what about the other end, the so-called gateway argument? So the concern that e-cigarettes are attracting new users, particularly young people who would not have otherwise used nicotine, start using the e-cigarette and then get addicted to nicotine and use it as a stepping stone to smoking. Okay, this is always going to be a concern, but there's very little research, so we don't know what percentage of the population this applies to. I'd argue that it's likely to be very small, and I think here we need to consider the likely proportions. So the number of e-cigarette users using e-cigarettes to quit smoking at the exit end, I think, is likely to be much larger, and there is research evidence to support this, than those using e-cigarettes as an entry to smoking at the other end. So to restate my three key points then, tobacco smoking is the single most preventable cause of death and disease. The priority should therefore be to reduce smoking by whatever method we have available to us. And e-cigarettes offer tremendous potential in this respect. And I think we should encourage smokers to try and use them, not to restrict their use. Switching to e-cigarettes might leave some smokers permanently addicted to nicotine. Nicotine itself is relatively safe. So I'd argue that nicotine addiction in, in a percentage of the population is favourable to the death and disease caused by smoking. And my third point relates to the gateway argument, that the number of smokers using e-cigarettes as an exit to smoking is likely to dwarf the number who enter smoking at the other end. Thank you.
Weber and iWeber Alexa. Best in Yorkshire for your AC needs. That's iWeber.co.uk and iWeber-Alexa.co.uk. iWeber and iWeber-Alexa.co.uk are proud sponsors of WeberTrails.tv. And we're back in the room. That was Lynn Dawkins uh, giving her tick. Um, next up on the list was Martin Dockrell from Ash. Now, I've spoken to Martin, um, and I think last week we played some video in uh, on one or other of the shows, or I, I tweeted it, I can't remember which now, I'm getting old, where I said I personally thought he didn't believe fully that e-cigs ought to be medicines. Um, all I'm gonna say is listen to what he's got to say. You've never heard anybody be quite so, what's the word I'm looking for? Evangelistic about e-cigs. Um, just have a listen. It's fantastically interesting listening. The next uh, speaker is Martin Dockrell. Um, Martin has been involved in harm reduction for more than 25 years, uh, first with needle availability schemes in the 1980s, then in gay men's health during the 90s, uh, in which time he worked in service delivery in the NHS, local government and the voluntary sector. Martin's research interests have centred around user perspectives and empowerment. Since joining Action on Smoking and Health in 2007, he has led the charity's work on researching the views of smokers. Martin. I wonder um, how much disagreement we will have, in fact, because uh, I look at the panel, and I know uh, the views of uh, the panel members, I think, pretty well, and I look at people I know in the audience, and actually it feels to me a little like only half the argument is in the room. Uh, my hunch is that probably everybody here would consider themselves an optimist uh, in tobacco harm reduction. That's to say, uh, like Lynn, we think uh, there is much more to be gained than lost through tobacco harm reduction, including electronic cigarettes. Um, and uh, I was going to start with a story of uh, a conversation I had just Friday evening. Uh, I was in the pub with my brother, and he said, uh, uh, my brother, I should say, is a committed smoker and a former vapor, and he said, uh, why do you keep banging on about electronic cigarettes? They're bad for you, and they don't work. Now, obviously, I disagreed with him because I disagree on both those counts. Unfortunately, I uh, had a bit of a, an uphill struggle. One, because he has a PhD in cell biology, and I don't. Uh, and the other is, uh, he has an electronic cigarette, and I don't. Uh, he has used, you know, he's had his electronic cigarette for maybe two years, used it on and off, didn't really get on with it. Um, I come from a big Irish-Italian family, which means uh, that most of us have been smokers at one time or another, and three are still smokers. Uh, I have my, uh, my big sister, uh, who has used her uh, e-cigarette a lot, and for a while at least, has completely replaced smoking with her uh, e-cigarette. E I have my brother, you know, know about him, he's a bit of a prickly character. I have uh, another sister. Uh, who uh, won't even try them. She won't even have a conversation about them. Um, and I think that kind of, uh, in a sense, uh, reflects the diversity, but not the proportions uh, of ex smokers' experience in this country. Um, so we have about a million uh, smokers who currently use electronic cigarettes. Um, and we have, by our survey, about two and a half million who smokers who have tried electronic cigarettes, we used them in the past, don't currently use them. And, and then probably twice as many as that combined are smokers who have never even tried them. So like my youngest sister. And, um, and a whole bunch of them share my brother's views. Rory and I have been doing these surveys on uh, users of uh, electronic, well, just general attitudes of smoking. It's a big survey. And now we have, we've been looking for the last three or four years at electronic cigarette use, and now we have quite a large number of users and ex-users. And um, it, it's really quite interesting to see why people stop using them. And, and overall, the largest number 
stopped using them because they weren't good enough. And, and I, I just think we need a, a system that gets really large numbers, not one million, but you know, close to 10 million smokers using electronic cigarettes, uh, replacing their smoking with electronic cigarettes. So uh, how do we win back that two and a half million disaffected uh, people who have tried uh, vaping and it didn't really work for them. How do we convince the five million who have yet to try to give it a go? Um, and, and I think what we need to do is that we have to reassure people that they are safe and effective, both safe and effective. Uh, and at the moment, there are a whole lot of people who think uh, that they're not effective because they've tried them and they've found them to be ineffective. And a whole lot of people uh, who say they're not safe, uh, even though uh, there's no evidence of, of harm so far. So that, that's my mission. Um, you know, reassure people that electronic cigarettes are safe and effective, as far as we can see. Uh, and that means we need safe and effective products which are plainly uh, and independently validated as safe and effective. I don't think the market can deliver that. I think that uh, I'm a, a market cynic. Uh, I think markets uh, act in the interest not for small consumers, but for big producers. It's the big players uh, who get the benefits from markets. So, uh, should you regulate uh, these products as uh, medicines? People keep saying to me, no, they're not medicines. People don't use them as medicines, therefore you can't regulate them uh, as medicines. And, and they point out that some vapors have used them to quit, but lots use them for... Uh, situations where they can't or don't want to smoke, what doctors would call temporary abstinence. Uh, some uh, are committed long-term users. Uh, some have used them just to cut down to replace some of the cigarettes they smoke. Um, and that's right. But you know what? Nicotine replacement therapy, currently licensed, are licensed for all those uses too. Okay? There's no reason why you couldn't uh, apply exactly the same standard uh, to those products. So, I mean, if we look at the proportions that people use these products for, according to our survey, so, I don't know, we had about 1,000 people who no longer use electronic cigarettes, about five, 600 who currently do, um, and uh, in our latest survey, 34% uh, said they wanted to quit completely, 28% said they wanted uh, to, they were using them to prevent uh, a relapse, because they'd had relapses before, relapse to smoking, that is. Um, about one in five said that they were using them uh, to cut down without quitting. They, did, they didn't want to quit. Uh, and about 15% saying that they were use, using them for uh, what we call temporary abstinence, for just quitting for a bit, for a while, not quitting for good. So there is no doubt electronic cigarette users are a key group, a key interest group in this debate, right? We need vapors to have a strong voice, and not enough people uh, are really paying attention to the experience of electronic cigarette users. But they're only one voice, and I've got to say, uh, I have to be concerned with the other voices too. I am concerned, not just with my sister, who's had a great experience, but also my brother, who's become a disaffected vapor, and my sister, uh, who distrusts them so much that she won't have them in the room with her. I'm not just con uh, concerned about that, I'm concerned too about uh, the, the rest of the public health lobby. Um, your experience of harm reduction in drug use, and uh, it's maybe different from mine. Uh, well, you, you said there was a, a lot of fighting, there was a huge amount of fighting, and the same in harm reduction in sexual health, and it was conducted in a way where people wouldn't get off their bloody high horses, and anybody who disagreed with them was a fool or a knave, and that's not good enough. We need a proper grown-up conversation about this. I mean, I think we, uh, and, and you, are having that grown-up uh, grown conversation, but I don't think it's good enough to pretend that everybody else, anybody who disagrees with you, is somehow uh, an idiot. So, yeah. thank you. And, and, and that means we have to have a bit of a conversation with some of my, my public health colleagues, because they don't listen enough uh, to uh, smokers and to vapors and to ex-smokers. Um, and uh, what I want them doing is... Uh, reassuring smokers that there is a safe and effective alternative to smoking, not spending that same time talking to politicians to try and get electronic cigarettes banned, or to try and get them banned on the tube, or in workplaces, or in taxis. None of that is helpful. So there's a really important job for, uh, for the public health uh, profession 
in tobacco harm reduction, but it's supporting it, not opposing it. So uh, I guess that's, uh, that's where I would uh, end it. Uh, we, we've got a big bus and we want them on it too. So that was Martin Dockrell. Uh, Sav, has, have we any comments from chat about what Martin had to say? Yes, we have. Um, I've had a couple of comments and loads have just come through now, which I'm probably going to miss. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ed West has asked, um, or more said, does the number of smoking deaths that are being quoted, does that come from the big farmers and the aunties? Uh, Mark Shaw has said, uh, you leave smokers to make their own choices and stop ramming it down their throats. In my experience, the more you push someone, the harder they dig their heels in. Let people find their own way. Yes. Charlie Vapes has said, he just said that the market can't deliver. Boo to that. Chris says, just leave us alone. Uh, we get you and we'll get your five million smokers on A6. Don't worry, Mr. Ash guy. Charlie's VPS also said the calibre of public health experts on the ProMeds regulation side is embarrassing. Just wait till Clive Bates and Dave start running circles around this guy. I was embarrassed for him. And Mark Shaw said, <laughs> now that is an interesting comment coming from Ash. Almost sounds like he is indirectly supporting us. And that, that, that last bit, that was the feeling I got when talking to, uh, to Martin afterwards. That was the feeling I got. I... I I, and I can't, I can't put my finger on it, but you felt the same, didn't you, Sav? Yes, it absolutely. Just, it just seems as though he was saying the words, but his heart wasn't in it, you know? Yeah. It felt as though it needed just another half inch, and it had it, it, it come to the dark side, as it were. Yeah. I've had a couple more comments just come. Thank you to Kat for bringing them through to me. Um, Safer Six has said, this is why bricks and mortar stores are so important because you can fully try before you buy to ensure you are fitted to the right kit for you. Yes. Which is so important. Absolutely. And Pie Boy said, problem I find when I offer smokers to try my ASIC is that they are only getting my type or version of vaping and there are so many other ways and not one of them Maybe after the same thing here, there's so many things that suit each person. Same as if I gave you my ASIC, you'd go, Ugh. Too right, I would. It'll have menthol in. Probably, and I would look at that thing you've got and go, no thanks. <laughs> That's cruel. I know. That's very, very cruel. You're I not, know. You're not going to enjoy the show tomorrow, are you? No. <laughs> <laughs> you've got to laugh. If you didn't, you'd cry. Yes. Um, yeah, there's, there's going to be some more of that coming up. Um, but I do want to, I do want to show you what everybody said, and 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 we'll kind of go on from there. I've got some of the Q and A as well, which was really good, and might embarrass one or two people, but never mind. Um, it, let's let's move on um, and go to Charlie Hamshaw Thomas. Now, Charlie Hamshaw Thomas is from Elites, and whatever you think of the Elites product, let me tell you, these guys have been moving heaven and earth to try and get all of this sorted out in the right way for us. I cannot, under any circumstances, knock them for that. The effort they've been putting in is amazing. And you, you just, you, you can't knock them. And I, I've got to give kudos to them. Um, let's go to Charlie and, uh, and hear what Charlie Hamshaw Thomas had to say. Um, the next... Uh panel speaker this afternoon is Charles Hamshaw Thomas, um, who is the Legal and Corporate Affairs Director for Zandera Limited, the supplier of e-lights, uh, the most recognised e-cigarette brand in the UK. Qualified as a lawyer, having worked in Slaughter and May and Clifford Chance, has spent 17 plus years in industry uh, with big UK corporates, Hanson Trust, Beezer Homes and Imperial Tobacco. Uh, involved in legal, business development, corporate affairs and CSR. As principal of CSR Solutions, specialist corporate social consultancy, is recognised as one of the UK's leading environmental campaigners and one of the world's leading experts on cigarette litter reduction. Joined Zandera earlier this year and has been spearheading their government and public affairs engagement in the UK, Europe and the US. Charles. Thank you, David. Thank you. Um, uh, some people tick us off when we say we're the biggest brand in the UK, um, but the Sunday Times, on the figures that were in the Sunday Times last weekend, we are the biggest uh, 
e-cigarette supplier in the UK at the moment. Um, there were three things that I was just going to talk about. Was one our surprise, one our pride, um, and one what our con our concern. Um, surprise? Why are we surprised? We, and I think it's picking up on what uh, Martin has just said. Um, why aren't we all rejoicing collectively on the massive reduction in tobacco consumption, use, and the associated dependency and harm? We should be all rejoicing. I mean, you know, we, 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 um, the, there's been, the tobacco companies have told me offline that, you know, our sales are reducing their sales. So, you know, I, I don't understand why we're not all rejoicing about that. All those that have an interest in uh, public health and uh, uh, reducing the harm caused to public health by tobacco. So that's where this was, we're surprised. And, and, and where we're proud, or where we, we, we take tremendous pride, I think, and I've picked this up, okay, I've only been working for six months or more in the, in the industry, but we take great pride in, 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 in what the public health experts and the, uh, the academics are saying about um, our work and the contribution we can make. Um, and we're not saying we're perfect companies by any stretch, but we do take pride in, in eminent scientists and so forth saying you're making a massive contribution to public health. Um, so we take pride in that. We take enormous pride in what our consumers are telling us. And, and there's, a, there's a real absurdity here. We, we get a lot of testimonials back from our consumers. And the MHRA have told us we can't print them. I mean, you couldn't make that up. Consumers write in to us and they say, your products have given a life-changing experience. And the absurdities of the regulations are we can't, we can't even print those. We can't even tell people about them because we'll have people who don't want us to succeed telling us that we're making claims and we must now be, therefore be a medicine. Um, so, but we are, nevertheless, and I, I picked this up from working in the company, um, that all the people who work in e-lights, or a very large majority of them, take great pride in what they're doing because they hear from consumers who are ringing up and saying, get me more, get me more, or whatever. I'm not saying, it, but of course we have dissatisfied customers as well, but the vast majority are, are, are saying you, you're doing great stuff. And the third element of our pride is we've taken a leading role in the regulation of the industry because uh, it wasn't my foresight, but it was my colleagues' foresight that they realised a few years ago we've got to get we've got to have a minimum product quality and standard, and they've been at the forefront of driving that and, and making sure that there is a um, uh, uh, a regulatory framework. And we get sick to death of people telling us and, and, and actually putting a myth out there that e-cigarettes are not regulated. That is a lie. And I wish people would stop saying it. There's a welter of rules and regulations. Um, and we have to make sure we comply with them all. Um, but we've been at the forefront of creating that. It's called the, for those who don't know, it's called the Industry Standard of Excellence. It's, 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 it's marshaled at the moment by the Electronic Cigarette Industry Trade Association. We wish more companies would join it. Um, we, we wish every single company that made electronic cigarettes would, would, would subscribe to that. It makes sure that you've got um, pharmaceutical grade nicotine, that you've got, you're, you're complying with all the different consumer regulations. And it goes in and it audits, it comes into our warehouse and, and goes through everything to make sure we're compliant with all the welter of regulations. Um, and by the way, we've, we've, we've said to the MHRA, and we've said to the Department of Health and everybody, look, there it is, tell us where it's faulty. Uh, we, 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 we want to make it as good as it can possibly be and create our own standard. Um, so we take pride in those, those three things. Um, our concern, um, well, basically, you know, we think we're on the, we want a level playing field. That's all we're asking for, a level playing field. Treat us in a level manner with our competitors. We are not trying to reduce the sales of Nicorette. We are trying to reduce, we are trying to provide an alternative to cigarettes, as simple as that. Um, and you know, we, we want to be on a football, uh, on a football playing field and people are trying to say, no, you should be in the boxing ring, we're going to rule you like a, like a boxing match. It's, you couldn't, again, you couldn't really make it up. We are not seeking to compete with a product which is sold to make you stop smoking, or help you stop smoking. Um, and and uh, this came up in Brussels last week, didn't it, Clive? This conversation about what is a level playing field. And, and, and the German MEP who's leading on the committee said, you know, it's got to be a level playing field and you've got to be competing against uh, nicotine replacement therapy products. And it just does not make sense. We want to be on a level playing field with cigarettes and consumer products. 
If we want to make a claim that they will help you stop smoking, no issues there at all. Just because they are helping people doesn't mean to say we have to, to market them and uh, sell them as that. Primarily, they're an alternative to cigarettes. And, and actually, just on that quickly, we were in the, in the House of Commons today, and the Labour MP we were talking to said, oh, smashing products, smashing products, because it just means I'm not smoking so much. I'm never going to stop smoking, but this is really, really helpful. And I'm enjoying them, and it gives me something to reduce the amount I smoke. There's somebody who doesn't want to stop smoking, but he just wants to smoke less. What do we do with people like that? Um, the, we do see ourselves as a responsible company, um, and we've always wanted to engage with even our critics and, and all the rest of it. Um, so at the very beginning, we've been hunting out, we wanted to speak with, with uh, Action on Smoking and Health, with the BMA, with the British Heart Foundation, with Cancer Research. Everybody's got an interest in tobacco control issues and we want to speak with government and, and all the rest of it. We want to address our critics' concerns. And the three points that we here heard un until this afternoon that we heard uh, from all of these groups were that they were concerned about it being a gateway to smoking um, and they, were, they thought we were marketing to minors. Um, well, I think uh, Lynn has addressed the point about gateway to smoking, but the, uh, marketing to minors, well, we could agree a voluntary code tomorrow morning with government and say, you know, we, we, it's already in our regulation that we won't market to minors, but we could quite easily have a voluntary code and, and uh, address marketing to minors. Um, undermining smoke-free legislation, this bizarre point that gets put out that we're, we're in danger of renormalizing smoking, whatever that might make, might might mean. Um, in response to that, we say, well, why don't we try and uh, normalise e-smoking? Wouldn't it be better, as Professor Britton has uh, so eloquently put, that if everybody turned to e-cigarettes, there'd be uh, five million less deaths? Um, it, it, to me, it's sort of slightly clutching at straws. And I, I, my colleagues know, I keep on saying this, but I think we should do a survey nationally about if you're a smoker and you're forced outside to have a, an e-cigarette, uh, will you light up a, a, a conventional fag or will you have an e-cigarette? And I, I think you'd find it would be very, very high percentage. So we, we, we want to treat people um, uh, in the same way as we're treating smokers who are trying to use a safer product. Again, I, I don't really understand the logic. Having said that, we, we're very keen to work around and, and come up with the right framework. And the third point um, is the involvement of the tobacco industry. For some reason, because they're involved, or they might get involved, this is a bad thing. Um, and I think, well, I don't, I don't think that's a very grown-up argument myself, but uh, I think there needs to be a slightly more uh, grown-up debate. I'm a bit disappointed to hear Martin suggest that now the emphasis is on making sure that every single product uh, makes every single person who tries it. Uh, I think the experience of quitting smoking Lots of people, no two people quit smoking in the same way. Um, and, and it's particularly disappointing when, Ash, we have been looking to try and speak to them, and now we're getting another argument being put in us, which it sounds like it's a hurdle for us to jump over, rather than a collaborative debate. Back to the first point, working together. And that's what we want to do. We want to work with everybody and, and, and build on the success that we've had so far. That was Charlie Hamshaw Thomas of Elite. Sav? Yes, got a couple of comments that have come in. Um, at the start of that, cigarettes in general were getting a bit of a bashing from chat, and Vaitman Mendez brought up a very valid point. He says, what about all those who started on Elite and the like and have switched to something else and are still not smoking? They all serve a good purpose regardless, and I thought that was a very valid comment. It is a good point, good point. Uh, Big Craig has also said e has got him off normal cigarettes and opened his eyes to the whole world of it and he's truly grateful for that. Yep. And Gillis has said that is the best argument we have. It should be on a level playing field with tobacco and not pharma. That is also true. It's it's got nothing to do with uh, with medicines, nothing to do with pharma and everything to do with cigarettes as far as I'm concerned. We'll take a quick blast of advertissement, that's French for advertissement, um, and, and, and we'll be back with Clive Bates.
Don't go anywhere, you won't want to miss this. And uh, there you go. That was uh, that was the advert. That was. was. <laughs> did you did you say somebody was asking about our Swedish friends? Yes, there's a questions being asked repeatedly, mainly by our very own Gary Dibley, may I say, and Jeff Benning. I want to know what you have done with our Swedish friends. Um, they've gone. They have to have everything edited and ready to go out on Friday, so they'll be editing in the morning before they get the aeroplane on the way back. Um, I'd have loved to have had Marlene and Terry here with us right the way through the show, but they've taken some footage of another show uh, so they can cut that in where they need to. However, what I didn't tell everybody right at the start of the show is that Thierry uh, smokes rollies. But just before they went, during the course of Charlie's video, they both came in to say night night. And uh, Thierry said he's gonna go, having spent the day with us and seen everything that he's seen about e-cigs. And there's one or two lying about the place uh, he's going to go and get himself one. I think that's what you call a result. Mm -hmm. I'm sure Clive would approve. Thank you, Charles. The next speaker uh, is Clive Bates, uh, former director of Action, Action yeah. on Smoking and Health Thank and you. former senior civil servant. He has worked in the Prime Minister's Strategy Unit, Environment Agency uh, for the UN in Sudan. Uh, this, this reads almost like the UN in Wales. <laughs> I think that's probably <laughs> the UN in Wales. I, 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 <laughs> There's no peacekeepers there. And the yet. DCC. <laughs> He's recently started his own advocacy and consultancy practice, counterfactual. He yeah. has no competing interests. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Um, I guess three main points for, for me um, the ends, what we're trying to achieve, the means, how we get there, and the distractions, all the uh, nonsense that's being produced to take us off the path. Um, my, my starting point, having worked in tobacco control, taken interest in it over many years is that the priorities now need to be rethought. Um, the, the correlation between tobacco control activity and actual outcomes on tobacco, you know, redu reductions in smoking, the uh, smoking prevalence, very, very poor, actually, very poor. And that movement hasn't really subjected itself to proper empirical testing. On the other hand, with harm reduction measures, case studies would be Sweden and Norway, where smokeless tobacco has been widely introduced, there's been a huge reduction in smoking. Uh, the lowest rates of smoking in Europe by far are found in Sweden, 13%, compared to 28% on average. Um, similar in Norway. Um, and with it, very low rates of smoking-related disease. We have proof of concept. Okay, now... In terms of what this directive in the EU will do, we've got the Commission saying that all the measures in it, so warning labels, uh, bans on flavourings and menthol, ten limits to packs of ten, bans on rounded corners, all sorts of stuff, 
will bring about a 2% reduction in, um, in consumption, basically, which is less than 1% equivalent reduction in prevalence. It's in the noise. It's in the noise. Okay. At the same time, we've got analysts, um, stock analysts, saying that we would expect um, around 50% or around, uh, we'd expect the volume of e-cigarettes to overtake the volume of cigarette sales in the United States within 10 years. Okay. We're talking about something far, far larger. Yeah, the public health lobby talks about this as if it's a sort of ancillary annoyance that they have to put up with and then throws up a lot of black propaganda about it to try and make sure it doesn't happen. And uh, Martin, I'm glad Martin acknowledged this because he'd have been forced to face it. There's been much of the problem of, about disinformation comes from the public health lobby. Okay, so I think we should, we should, when we're talking to European and British politicians, we should have our eye on the big prize. And the big prize is harm reduction through e-cigarettes and through smokeless tobacco if it wasn't banned. Now, means. Um, I, I enjoyed Martin's reflection on uh, the way markets work and, uh, and, and how they work to favour big companies. That, as you will know, is, was a piece of complete nonsense. Um, what really favours big companies is very high regulatory barriers to entry. Um, very large investments required to enter or stay in the market. Uh, very complex technical regulations. High investments in, uh, in automation, in process control, um, in personnel uh, that are qualified to understand technical regulations. Um, and it's that that is driving, or would drive, if we had medicines regulation, would drive the uh, e-cigarette industry back to a tobacco industry-dominated oligopoly, which is where it will head directly towards if they get their way. Okay? It's also not a very good way of producing good products, quote, good products, i.e. a good product is, in harm reduction terms, one that people want to use. Okay? Now, the crowdsourcing effects of the demand that you get in markets are a better way of getting to that than a regulator determining that a certain dose of nicotine administered in a certain way is the right product for the market. Okay? Now, you can see this with medicines regulation. Medicines, medicines regulation already applies, as Martin says, to harm reduction indications for NRT. But nobody likes them, virtually no one uses them, and they've been a dismal failure. So if that's what success looks like, I would rather not have medicines regulation involved in, promote, in the movement towards e-cigarettes. Okay? Um, there is a perfectly sensible alternative. Um, there is a lot of consumer protection regulation that already applies. Um, that can move from general to specific if necessary. Uh, it's perfectly possible to set standards for e-liquids, for devices, to have CE warnings and so on. There's a perfectly serviceable regulatory framework out there waiting to be used that has been ignored, uh, it's not been consulted on, it's not been considered, the options have not been properly appraised, yet it would be far superior to what's proposed instead. And then finally, if, I'm, if I may, distractions. Uh, others have mentioned these, I won't dwell on them. The first is the gateway effect. Please, please, please don't be bought, bought, caught out by this. Um, a little history, the product Snooze was banned across Europe because of a gateway effect argument. Um, it, it, it was wrong then, it's obviously wrong now. Snooze has been an incredible gateway out of smoking, both for adults and for young people. The evidence is beyond uh, dispute about that in both Sweden and Norway, yet none of the health campaigners who push for this have been willing to engage with the evidence and reverse their position. Okay? So these arguments are put forward as distractions. They're, tr they're, they're there because there's an underlying puritanical ideological dislike of these things, and these are proxy arguments that can be thrown up as kind of flack. The next one is renormalization. Utter cobblers, it's normalising e-cigarettes, it's not renormalising tobacco. If you can't tell the difference between an e-cigarette and a tobacco, you should be in a playgroup, uh, nowhere near a restaurant or a public place. It's completely preposterous. The, the next thing is dual, dual use. Um, dual use is a good thing. Okay, It's people cutting down on smoking and often on a journey towards um, stopping smoking altogether. By the way, I, I, I disagree with you about zero nicotine being the, 
be, being the goal. Um, it's not the ideal. I, I remember discussing this with, you, many of you will know Anne McNeil, uh, Professor Anne McNeil. She said exactly the same as you. It's, the ideal would be to get to nicotine free. Of course, we were discussing this over dinner with a nice glass of red wine in front of us. And I said, uh, well, is, the ze is zero alcohol the, uh, the ideal? Uh, at that particular moment, it wasn't. And I'm afraid she had to concede that. And, and I think if you accept that there are benefits associated with the drug nicotine, uh, and no harms, then you have to say that it's rational for people to want to use the drug because it gives them benefits. Um, what other, there's another, dis, I, think, I think I'll leave the, the, the distraction. I think behind this, I just want to say there's a lot of things that are thrown up as distracting flap that mask an underlying dislike or disgust or distaste for these things that is actually they're not their business, uh, but they're using these other sort of population arguments to try to get a more restrictive environment for this completely inappropriate, completely unethical, completely wrong. Thanks. And that was Clive Bates. And like many, I would like to have his babies. Sav? I think you'd have to join the queue, I'm telling you. As good as that, is it? Yes, Gary's still putting his way forward. Um, <laughs> Again? Yeah. Daz is even offered. Well, <laughs> our very own vaping Daz has offered. Does he bend for a friend? Will he risk it for a biscuit? Apparently so. <laughs> there um, you go. <laughs> yeah, we've got an awful lot of uh, comments from chat regarding Clive. But first of all, I have to say, I hurt my hand clapping at what Clive had to say because <laughs> 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 he was just so good. Yes. Um, but Mark Shaw has said TPD is all political posturing and little substance. Big Craig has said, I could listen to this guy all night. He talks so much sense. MJ Jones says, this is a brilliant argument. Paul Daniel Kendrick says, you can't argue against anything he says. And Dick Puddlecourt says, Martin Dockrell just got owned by a proper tobacco controller. One with one eye on ethics. He's not wrong either. He's not mm -hmm. wrong. Um, those four having spoke, there was a fat lad who doesn't normally wear it. Did I see somebody taking the mickey out of me wearing a jacket? Uh, yeah. What did he say? They, they were having a little bit of a chuckle at you in a suit. Well, you'll have an even better chuckle. I didn't have any trousers on. No, it's not true. <laughs> it's not true. Um, I might have had a little bit. They don't want to see. Oh, Right. We are going to run over. I do apologise. I got on my hind legs next. Well, I didn't. I sat still. Have a watch. Speaker is uh, Dave Dawn, who is a vapor of well over four years standing, having previously been a smoker for 43 years uh, and at 60 a day. Yeah. If anyone knows whether e six are safe and effective in comparison to cigarettes, he does. Dave. Thank you. Um, I'm, I have got no idea how I'm going to follow Clive. <laughs> um, I haven't. He's a hero. Well, I, I, I do know this the concept of harm reduction is one that it would seem to me that public health doesn't actually understand. And yet, it's something that everybody in here practices every day, whether they know it or not. Let me give you some examples and tell you why the harm reduction process is so important in all of this, and why it actually informs the notion that e-cigs are not medicines, and never can be medicines. Let me tell you first why e-cigs are here. They are intended, broadly speaking, to allow the nicotine user, what we used to call a smoker, to continue nicotine use, but in a much less risky way. And that, that much less, by the way, is by orders of magnitude. And that means a lot. Consider harm reduction that we all practice every day. Now, you might have noticed I'm not a slim boy. I'd like to be. And I used to enjoy full fat coke, but full fat coke, and I've been told to call it cola, but sod it, full fat coke is chock a block with sugar, if you believe what you're told by the campaigners. So to practice a little bit of harm reduction, and I hadn't thought of it as that, I drink diet coke, because I'm trying to keep the waistline <coughs> under 42. It's a big waistline. So I drink diet coke to reduce the fattening harm, the obesity, that might come from the full fat coke. Does anybody hear from coke? I'm sorry, substitute Pepsi, whatever you like. Um, 
And that's a lifestyle choice. I choose to do that for my lifestyle. I don't want to be big and fat and ugly. I'm quite happy just to be ugly. Let's go on that, therefore, Diet Coke is not a medicine. I'm not using it medicinally. I'm using it as a lifestyle choice. What about the parents of little Johnny? He's eight year old, he wants a skateboard for Christmas. So they buy him one, and skateboards are risky. So, they don't have to, but they're pretty sure Johnny's gonna fall off, so they get knee pads, elbow pads, body armor, helmet, responsible parent, you may think. They are reducing the harm that's gonna to come to Johnny when he falls off the skateboard. Does that make the knee pads, the helmet, the body armor, and everything else in medicine, does it help? It means that they are being responsible parents and they are preventing their children from needing a medicinal intervention later on when he has fallen off the skateboard, because he's gonna. So those aren't a medicine. So let's come back to ASICs. Their use is a lifestyle choice. Just as the safety gear helps prevent future medical intervention in the case of a skateboard accident, so ASICs help prevent a future medical intervention for smoking related diseases. The two are directly analogous. Neither is a medicine. And it's exactly the same that somebody who's looking after their body mass index might choose to drink diet cola above regular cola. And in exactly the same way, the ESIG user chooses the least risky alternative to continue doing something they were going to do anyway. Neither diet, coke, nor ESIGs are medicines. They're both lifestyle choices. So I want to hit the, uh, the safety, quality, and efficacy thing. We'll start with safety. And if we believe what anti-smoking campaigners tell us, smoking lit tobacco is probably the most risky pastime you can indulge in. Agreed? No, I can think of, I mean, like, motor car racing, racing and maybe, and they're, 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 it's pretty risky. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty risky. <laughs> in terms of... It's not good. I'm not going to recommend it. It's, it's not good. It's not good. It's not good. So just about anything would be safer for you than smoking lit tobacco. Now, there is a concept of safe enough. In my earlier example, Johnny's not 100% safe, but he's safe enough, at least as far as his parents are concerned, and probably as far as a and &E concerned as well. And that's the case with ECs. The concept of safe enough is one that adults deal with every day, and it should be their decision as to what is safe enough, not some authority basing its decisions on absolute safety. Now, they tell me that NRT is safe enough, and it might be, but it's bloody ineffective, I've tried it. It doesn't work. For 93% of my contemporaries, NRT is useless, completely. It's not attractive in any way, shape or form. That's why I choose not to compare ACIGs with NRT, because these things are much more comparable to cigarettes in terms of what they will do for the smoker. And the smoker is the one that chooses what's good enough and what's safe enough. So those who practice the art of jumping out of aeroplanes wearing a parachute obviously think that's safe enough. I choose not to follow their example. Because I'm sorry, I've seen what happens when you splatter off the tarmac from 40,000 feet. It's not pretty and I don't want to do that. But that does not give me the right to insist that other people do not do it. I don't like it, but I'm not going to stop somebody else from doing it. And I don't see why anybody should stop me from using an e-cigarette because I've chosen that lifestyle choice. It applies to e-cigs for one and a half million users. Somewhere between one and one and a half million users in the UK, they're safe enough. And that, at the end of the day, is what matters. We already know their orders, orders of magnitude safer than smoke tobacco, and if the users feel they're safe enough, then that is as it should be. Next, quality. And if ever, quality, if ever there was a subjective um, measurement of something's value, quality is it. Now, I know somebody that uses one of these things, right? And it's, it's from China, and the guy I was talking to said, that's a quality piece of kit. It's not, it's rubbish. It works. But it's nowhere near the quality of that. <laughs> you have no idea. You've got no idea what's in either of these things. Let me tell you, in both cases, 
The statements are wrong. It's not rubbish. It works. It does the job. It's just not up to a standard that I, as a Range Rover driver, would expect. <laughs> you see my point? How many? Who came on a push bike today? There you go. Now, I'm sorry, I couldn't do that. I couldn't. You're too far. <laughs> I'll match it. But there you go. Quality is, is completely subjective. And nobody can tell me what's a good enough quality for me. Nobody can tell me what's a good enough quality for my wife. I make do with any old rubbish, but I want the best for my wife. She makes that choice, not me. Gentlemen, you who have been to buy Christmas presents know exactly what I mean. Yes. I need go no further than that. Quality is a subjective measurement. So for any regulatory authority to say that they're going to measure on quality is a complete and total and utter bloody nonsense. Finally, efficacy. Now this is a whole different can of worms. Stick your hand up if you're a vapor, please. Would you now grab the device that you have been using during the course of the day and wave it in the air? Please have a look. These are what all of these different people have decided to use. And I dare bet you now that if I asked any two of them to swap, they'd say actually, no. <laughs> they would, they would say actually, no, if, 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 what? He's trying to sell his. <laughs> Charlie, I can't see what it is from here. If it was anything decent, I would swap you for this gold one, but other than that, look, I know what's effective for me, and obviously all of these vapors in here know what's effective for them. And I tell you now for a certain fact that what's effective for one will be rubbish for another. It's a bit like Marmite. If somebody comes out with a Marmite juice, that's going to be effective for somebody that likes Marmite, but it's not going to be effective for me. If somebody comes out with a, dare I say it, custard flavored juice, that's going to be effective for salve. But it's not going to be effective for me. I don't like it. And at the bottom line of all of this, when it comes down to medicines regulation, you know for an absolute certain fact, because Jeremy Mean has said so, when it comes to the fateful day, everything that we've just been waving about in the air comes off the market. And we will be left with something that is, frankly, more akin to NRT than anything else. And we already know. People don't want to buy NRT. It's not sexy, it's not pleasant, it's not effective, it's not nice. So on behalf of every vapor everywhere in the UK, I would say, hands off our ACs. We know what works for us, we know what we like, we know where to buy it, we can advise the people that want to go on there, and we do, so butt the hell out. Finally, just to uh, come on a couple of things that, that Martin said, and I'm not picking on you Martin, because these are things that other people have been doing, not you specifically. Um, this whole, your brother saying that they're bad for you, hmm. you know where that's come from? That's come from the BMA. These are people that are supposed to be looking after our health, and they've said, and they haven't contradicted when it's been said, that e-cigs are worse for you than tobacco cigarettes. When the World Health Organization said e-cigs are worse for you than tobacco cigarettes, did the BMA, who should be held in high regard, get on its hind legs and say, actually, no, they're not? Did they hell? They kept their mouths shut. That's not a, a fine state of affairs. Cancer Research UK, exactly the same. When these states, statements were made by the World Health Organization, that should know better. Did they argue? Did they hell? They kept their mouths shut and let people like your brother believe that that was the case. It's utter rubbish. It's nonsense and it needs stopping. How to win back vapours? Easy answer. Get onto Weatherspoons and all of these train companies and tell them they're being a set, and I'm sorry about this, of complete arseholes for banning them from their, from their places of, of work and employment and everything else. These things are not dangerous. If people can use them everywhere, they'll use them everywhere. Let them use them everywhere. Um, finally, as you've probably gathered, I don't think NRT is a medicine now either. The MHRA made that mistake. That's all I've got to say. Thank you very much. Yeah, some fat bloke. Um, Sav? Um, 
Gary Dibney said he's changed his mind and he's sending his wife over tomorrow. That's no good. She kind of cook. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, <to> the Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Chat absolutely loved that. Oh, I've got Mitch Douglas says, don't know who he is, but this chap seems to know his stuff. Gary has said, uh, Gary said an awful lot. Mitch also said, superb stuff, DD. Safe for six stars says, this is gold and could listen for hours. Dick Puddlecoat said, as someone once said, you can't use that emergency exit to escape the rage and fire because we haven't studied if it's slippery outside or not. Mm hmm. Gary's also said, if there's one person who voices for me, Dee Dee is doing it right now. Um, Johnny Davery has asked me to uh, put this on in response to uh, what Martin Dockrell says. And he says, for the record, 50% of racing drivers don't die from their activity like smokers do. He meant to say that yesterday, but he got focused on his own experience. Mm -hmm. And Funny Trickster has said, wow, this is the most interesting speech I've heard. Sorry, Clive. <laughs> Oh dear me, no, 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 trust me, I, I was venting, Clive, Clive is, is a very, very clever man and knows all of the arguments, he is my hero, he is my hero. Mine too. Yes, without a shadow of a doubt, he's, he's, uh, he's an amazing bloke. Shall we do the Q&A? Let's see, Q&A. Q&A? Q&A. Well, it's, it's queued up. Um, yeah, oh, we're overrunning, what the hell, here we go. There was a very interesting Q and A session. Enjoy. Um, question for Martin, really, because I this is coming from the world of illegal drugs. I know absolutely nothing about any of this whatsoever, so this is really quite interesting for me. I just wanted to know when Martin said he was talking about efficacy, about then for some people, for a lot of people, they don't work, yeah, which I think is what you said. What do you actually mean? We asked them why they had stopped using them, and right. they said uh, they weren't good enough. Um, I've got to say, the problem with my brother is that he is bloody well informed. He's a, a jobbing, uh, he runs a, a biological research unit, and uh, he gets his stuff from uh, his reading of the, of the uh, academic literature. Uh, and, and he knows that better than me. Uh, so, so every time I try and explain to him uh, why you know the, the evidence that uh, electronic cigarettes aren't harmful, he will go into the micro microbiology of risk. But, uh, there's one thing that I don't think any of us have mentioned uh, uh, that we, we should tackle, and that's the question about um, uh, the, the, the period of time that we've had uh, e-cigarettes available, and uh, how do we know they're safe if we haven't got uh, 30 years of use. And I was challenged at a tobacco control conference a while back when they said, uh, you can't tell me that these products are safe until people have been using them for 30 years. And I said, good, let's get on with people uh, using them. In 30, 30 years, we'll come back and we'll tell you if they're safe or not. And, and you can't find out if they're safe in the long term. So, uh, so in terms of my brother and other uh, e-cigarette users who found them uh, uh, ineffective, just as uh, good enough for you, safe enough for you is a subjective thing. So, for my brother and for other vapors, uh, effective enough for them, I think, is a subjective thing. Sorry, if I still don't get this. If good enough or effective or ineffective in what way? I mean, my understanding is people smoke cigarettes for the nicotine, not the smoke. Is that right? They, they, they said they, were, they weren't good enough for giving nicotine. So, they weren't getting enough nicotine out of an e cigarette. Is that what you mean? Can I make a quick comment on this? Because I, I also have a, a brother story on this, uh, which is a modification on this. Um, my unfortunate brother has schizophrenia and has been, a, a, like many people with the, that condition, has been a heavy smoker all his, uh, all his life. And uh, about a year ago, he tried an e-cigarette. He bought something in the supermarket and he didn't like it, uh, didn't work, uh, and it was crap. Uh, so he stopped using it and went back to smoking. Um, he then, uh, a friend of his actually, introduced him to a different brand. Uh, he looked it all up on the internet and he bought something from a small company which is based in Oldham, called, it's not a commercial list, uh, you'll see the point in a minute, uh, called iBreathe. I'd never heard of it before, don't know what it does. But it makes, it supplies a, an e-cigarette which he has started to use six months ago. And he declared, uh, I saw him uh, two weekends ago, he said he hadn't had a single tobacco cigarette since. Absolutely loves it, it's perfect, his uh, health has improved, his self-esteem has improved, 
uh, and he's one very happy customer. That company will not survive medicines regulation. That product will not survive medicines regulation. That will be taken away. And we have to hope that one of these improved, and I should use the quotes around improved, because they won't be improved, products will actually do a better job and he won't go back to, um, he, he won't go back to smoking. I think it's completely unrealistic, Martin, to expect a new category to appear that immediately and instantaneously appeals to everybody who is a smoker. That's 20, 20 to 27% of adults in Britain, depending on which survey you believe, would, find, would somehow find the products that suit them and the products that will be there that are capable of being suiting them so early in the evolution of this process. Why, why would you expect that? I don't expect it. Good. Like well, it. Well, it's not surprising there are people who don't think they're good enough. The, the question is what makes products better? And actually what makes products better is very rapid, is a lot of competition, um, a lot of creative destruction, a lot of innovation, short product cycles, the ability to make incremental improvements in the products without going back to a regulator to launch an entirely new application for a marketing authorization and so on. This is how almost every other marketplace known works. Why wouldn't it work for e-cigarettes? <coughs> Another question, gentlemen there. Hi, Oliver Kirsch, I'm the founder of eCigaretteForum.com, uh, which I think is the largest um, uh, e-cigarette social network in the world. Um, but that one sounds too chauvinistic. I think uh, e-cigarettes and the internet are the central story in all of this, actually. I think all the development and rapid pace of change that, that Clive has spoken about has come about and facilitated by websites like mine and others, uh, whereby people have really focused um, on the uh, explicitly declaring what they want from products, and uh, entrepreneurs out there have gone out and created these things for them. I mean, we have witnessed the most extraordinary cycle over the last five years. Um, in terms of Martin, your, your, your particular statement about uh, that, that eventually this will end up in big business, I, I, I agree 100% with Clyde. I actually think that, that uh, when Clyde brought up his little story about uh, drinking with Al McNeil, it, it suddenly switched in my mind that, that what we might see here is a transitioning from a, a model dominated by four or five big tobacco companies to something actually much more like uh, the wine industry, with literally hundreds of uh, sort of boutique, small, medium enterprises. We have 300 alone registered on my website, 300 separate suppliers, all uh, de developing new products, and uh, we, done so we have a million uh, individual visitors to my website every month. Uh, we do surveys with these people and we find out exactly what they're after. And they are after uh, devices like these, without a shadow of a doubt. They're, they're, up the, they're, they're the ones that are recommended, they're the ones that people buy, uh, because they're ones that provide uh, that high sort of fidelity experience that, uh, that at, at the moment, um, by and large, can't be bought from the high street. And the reason it can't be bought from the high street is because uh, there isn't proper profitability in it. There really isn't. You can buy a bottle of e-liquid for £10 that will last you two weeks. Not every vapor, but many vapors for two weeks. This idea of the profitability that you're talking about, where, where four or five people will dominate the market, is a, is, is a fancy. It can't happen. This is truly disruptive. This is going to utterly change the landscape uh, in tobacco because the, the cost of entry to the market is so low. All it takes to enter into this is understanding what vapors want and producing uh, uh, devices and chemicals that, that technically are, are very, very, very straightforward. And the distribution is, is there on <coughs> the internet and so on and so forth. This liberalized model, which we have at the moment, is absolutely profound. It's utterly disruptive. And um, by seeking to med medicalize it, it will utterly destroy all of that. I mean, it really will. It, <laughs> the whole thing will go. And uh, we, we will lose the, the, the biggest uh, advance we've, we've ever seen in, in public health. I mean, that, that is the bottom line here. The, the real bottom line on that one, if I might just jump in, of course, is you will get no more recruits to e-cigs. That's the problem. There'll be nobody else switching from tobacco to e-cigs, and there'll be a very large proportion of those who currently use e-cigs who will not be able to get supplies, and will go back to smoking tobacco. Um, as I said right at the start, in, in, in my little bit of bio there, I used to smoke 60 a day, 
I like nicotine. I like what it does for me. I'm not particularly keen on cigarettes anymore, but trust me on this. If I can't get the e-liquid I need because it's been regulated out of existence, there's only one place I'm going to be able to get nicotine. Guess where that is? Corner shop, red and white packet, three of them a day, and I'll pay the money. So will a lot of my contemporaries. Trust me on that. So, the lady. Thank you. Catherine Durden, President of the Siege of the Trade Association. I just wanted to pick up quickly on something that Clive just said about where you've got swift innovation and new products coming in. It, it, under the existing regulations, it is actually necessary for um, new products coming in to demonstrate that they are compliant with the regulations on CE and ROS, for example, for the electronic safety and of course to have the e-liquid tested. So there is robust pre protection for consumers, even with a rapid pace of innovation. But I do want to just ask both Martin and Clive, what you seek, Martin, to, to achieve by medicines regulation, and what you think can be improved and um, how you think that would benefit. And Clive perhaps can give an idea of, of why you don't think that would work. Well, I, I think uh, that Clive and I actually both have the same uh, end goal in mind, uh, though uh, Clive, I'm sure, thinks I am naive in the route that I'm, uh, I advocate for it. Uh, and that's that we want to see uh, large numbers of smokers. Um, I confess, perhaps when I said 10 million smokers, I was being, uh, I was over-egging the pudding, but large numbers of smokers uh, replacing uh, their smoking uh, partly or totally with uh, a safe and satisfying product. Um, and, um, and, and here is plainly where I differ with Clive. I think nobody will be uh, any, in any doubt that Clive has much more faith in the market, in market economics, than I did. Um, I put my hands up to that. Um, I, I suspect that uh, we will see uh, a market version uh, of, uh, of the future play out in uh, the US. We're already seeing uh, the much more rapid uh, entry of uh, big tobacco companies into that market. I think Imperial Tobacco's recent acquisition uh, is particularly concerning. What they've done is they've not uh, so much acquired uh, the producer of uh, electronic cigarettes as the proprietor of intellectual property. It seems to me that their, ambitious, uh, their ambition is to close down any rivals they can, uh, who uh, have, um, they would argue, uh, breached their intellectual property rights. So, uh, I, and I've got to say, medicines regulation won't stop that. Uh, medicines regulation won't stop a uh, tobacco industry dominated uh, market, but certainly I think the free market isn't going to either. I think uh, what will happen is as this market uh, matures, is that we'll see big players coming in with big advertising budgets. And how much your product is used will depend more on how much it, uh, it's advertised than how much nicotine it delivers. Can I take issue with that? Why, 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 is it, why is it reprehensible that a tobacco company owns an e-cigarette company? We, at, the, at the National Smoking Cessation Conference, it was agreed by the audience that e-cigarettes were a positive thing. And then there was a suggestion that they become a negative because a tobacco company owns it. You're saying that a tobacco company can only have one motive in this, is it? Well, yeah, the, the one motive is to maximise the profits, yeah. Um, and well, e-cigarettes are a very profitable product, as we're showing. Yeah, indeed. The, the retailers are making, making good money on it. So I mean, if, indeed, if you're looking at the profit motive, I mean... Am in I the going analyst... to a question or not? I don't profit. know. No, 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 no. So, uh, you said that they're making big inroads into the, uh, that e-cigarettes are making big inroads into the uh, tobacco market. Uh, I think the best market analysis suggests about 1% of the, uh, the nicotine market uh, is now occupied by, including tobacco, is uh, in, occupied by electronic cigarettes. And that's growing, but it's not a big threat. However, what we have seen, and I think uh, Robert West's toolkit uh, study demonstrates this, is what they've done is they've very, uh, in a very large measure replaced nicotine replacement therapy. And here's where I uh, agree with uh, Dave, is that electronic cigarettes are or are not a medicine in exactly the way nicotine replacement therapy is or is not a medicine. I think nicotine replacement uh, therapy is a medicine, and you said it's not. No. Right, there you are. So, so, so we, 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 nicotine replacement we, 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 kind of, we kind of agree but disagree. I, I think we do. Uh, so what? I mean, well, yeah. I mean, don't, don't get the wrong well, way. Well, I think we agree on it what we It could be either, depending on how you look at it. 
Just a, a, a reflection on Catherine's uh, question. I'm mean, amazed by this sort of touching faith in statist mm. solutions to things. I mean, I'm not sure where s state control of a market actually uh, has been a conspicuous success. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's important. Uh, it's important with medicines. Let's get, let, the terms like safety and efficacy and quality are banded around, but in medicines regulation, they're terms of art. Okay, you have quality because you have to deliver when, when something has a therapeutic effect or serious side effects, you have to deliver precisely the right dose. You don't need to do that with um, nicotine, um, with uh, e cigarettes. The smoker controls the dose, dose by adjusting their smoking behavior. Um, safety is about, is, it, is really, it's a medical term, it's about making sure that when you license a medicine, uh, the balance between risks of side effects and adverse events uh, are outweighed by mostly by the therapeutic benefits that you get from it. So these, these terms are terms of art. We must not bandy them round too loosely. In terms of a, a market analogy, I quite like the wine one, but the one, I, the one I've drawn to, which is an amazing free market, by the way, is food. Um, and food and restaurants, uh, per perhaps. Now, where, what you get, what, the interesting thing about food is it's regulated, but the barriers to entry are quite low. And it is fantastically competitive. It is amazingly competitive. Um, you see places coming and going, um, little restaurants will come and go. Of course, you have the big players. You've got McDonald's, you've got Unilever, you've got Pizza Express. But God, if we only had them, can you imagine what it would be like? It'd be awful. And if, in fact, in fact, what we what we have um, is a very competitive market that delivers incredibly diverse, high quality food in Britain now. Um, and through the processes of creative destruction, is endlessly innovative, producing good products that people like. And that that to me is where we we ought to be. There's nothing wrong with big players. There's, there's a lot wrong if you only have big players selling commoditised products. Okay, thank you. I'm aware there's quite a hand at the back there. Yep. Uh, yeah, can I just... Sorry. And that went on for a lot longer than we've got time to cover and also a lot more than the footage I've got because that's pretty much where we ran out um, of what I was able to get from, uh, from Andy uh, on, on the night. Um, there was lots more. And it was... An absolute joy and a pleasure to be there, wasn't it, Sav? It was. It was a real pleasure. Um, what What did you come away thinking? <sighs> All right, this is going to sound a bit strange, but I think you'll know exactly what I mean. Uh, the overall impression I walked away with was from Martin Dockerell that he is so close to being on the side that he needs to be, the position he needs to be in. It's scary. He's desperate. He knows meds regs aren't right. Mm. But he just needs that little bit extra to get to where he needs to be. I would agree. Have Chad got anything to say about that? Chad, I've got a lot to say. Um, regarding Martin, uh, smoke to vape Andy has said, slight U-turn possibly, question mark. Uh, Lee Seabiscuit has said, there is no bigger fool than an educated fool. Charlie Vape Best said, the pro ASIC team is so strong, victory should be instantaneous, but the reality is it's going to be a long, hard slog. Yes. Mark Shaw has said, the government should scrap NRT and smoking cessation offices and put that money into vape lounges so vapers can advise those who care to switch. Oh, yes. Yeah. Charlie's also said, love the analogy to the winemaking industry, way to go. Mark Shaw again said, Martin doesn't believe it. He wants to protect his job, so he's saying he does because that's what Ash wants, but you can hear it in his voice. Mm -hmm. Dick Puddlecourt has said, it's the same old slurs against big tobacco instead of taking the issue at hand and debating properly. John Springer said, and all the unstated assumptions that big pharma are the benign force for good, not in it for profits and shareholders at all. And Charlie has said, Probably for public, the problem for public health lobby is funding big tobacco products for tobacco harm reduction. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, and just on the big pharma thing, I think they should all be forced to be not for profit. 
They're supposed to be for health, not for profit. But that's just me. You might disagree. Um, it's been a great pleasure sharing the last hour and a half with you. And it's been a great pleasure to have Marlene and Thierry here as well. Um, if they're watching this later on, catch up. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and thanks for making today as nerve-wracking as it was. Um, Lord only knows what's going to come out of that. I'm sure I don't. Um, the fight's still on. And I think we need to take the fight wherever it needs to be taken. And I just said one thing right at the end of all that, that little lot when we were asked to sum up, and I don't have the footage there. But I'm going to keep on fighting until they nail down the coffin lid. And if the government wants to come and take my e-cig, it'll have to prize it from my cold, dead hands. And everybody that was there, thank you for joining me when I said that. And it wasn't just the vapours. Did you notice? I did. That was, it was something of an event. Um, and I was, I was very pleased and privileged to have been there, just as I'm pleased and privileged to have been able to share the last hour and a half with you. And Sav, I'm going to say it again. You are a star without any fear or favour, without a shadow of a doubt. She, she shepherded me when I was panicking yesterday because I, I get scared to death in London. Um, <laughs> But she made sure I didn't panic and we actually got home safely, didn't we? We did. And I also have to give a big shout out to our amazing chat and the team that have held everything together while we've been flitting left, right and centre all over the place. These are all absolute stars. And Dave, the chat said it all. You and Jeremy Clarkson should be running the country. I'm not sure there's enough beer in the country for it to allow us to do that. Um, I, I'm going to echo what Sav said. Um, I, I, I can't believe how good Teague Talk is. I really cannot express how delighted I am at that. I think it's fabulous. Uh, and I've got to say, uh, what a team. The whole team. The VT TV team. I, I'm, I'm proud to be part of it. And I'm proud to have the chat we do. I, I know I keep on saying we've got the best chat on the planet, but I truly believe it. We, I really do. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I will see you with, uh, with Keith and Daz tomorrow night when uh, we'll be lifting weights and uh, doing all kinds of other things. But until then, vape on, vape hard, and nil carborundum illegitimite. That's Latin for don't let the bastards grind you down. Um, we'll see you next time. Until then, take care of yourselves. It's been great. Cheers. Bye.